Good evening, everybody. It's our pleasure to, to welcome Hans Peter Hofer come from Cologne, but we can cannot do it in, in Tartu. We would would be happy to have him, but we have uh, him on the screen today, and uh, he will talk about the legal history and current law, or or legal history part in the in the PhD thesis uh, on on contemporary law. Uh, in some way, it is very very right to have a, a German professor to for to speak about this this topic because the uh, the this uh, historical introduction in in the in the monograph or, or in thesis on the contemporary law have German origin. It was uh, in the beginning of the 19th century, uh, the um, Friedrich Karl von Savigny in very young, young years uh, published the monograph about the law on possession, das Recht des Besitzes. And uh, it, it, uh, this book is, uh, is called uh, ideal or, or standard of, of uh, monograph in, in, in law or, or dissertation in law. It was not Savini's dissertation, but uh, Savini wrote in the time in, uh, when in several German territories, the ancient Roman law was a valid, valid law and law in force. Uh, we know it's not anymore the time of, of jus commune or, or of gemeines recht, but it's very, it is very usual to, to have this um, historical introduction in, in, in uh, legal monographs, in legal, legal dissertations. Uh, sometimes it doesn't have any reason. But it is not so easy that we can say it's the rule should be not to have historical introduction if you have, have your thesis in, in contemporary law. It, it's very complicated because uh, large parts of our, our legal orders cannot be understand, understand that they are not understandable at, and are not explainable without any, any historical, uh, without any help from legal history. So, so it's a very, very topical topic, I, I would say. And I'm very happy that uh, Hans-Peter Haferkamp, professor for legal history and professor for, for civil law at the University of Cologne, was, uh, is ready to, to have this presentation um, not only in, uh, in uh, also for, for our audience. Uh, I know that, that Hans-Peter Haferkamp uh, already have uh, uh, teach, not teach, but, but uh, have had this presentation for the PhD students on the doctoral school in, uh, in uh, home university. But the doctoral school in Cologne is, is not the uh, um, interdisciplinary doctoral school is the doctoral school of the faculty of law. Uh, we have also an event from, uh, from our doctoral school that is interdisciplinary in, uh, actually, but, but uh, I assume our audience today would be uh, the legal one. Uh, all all uh, PhD students and also all supervisors are, are lawyers. In, in that sense, we don't uh, don't have any any great interdisciplinary discussion. So I I I would now uh, close my 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 short introduction and uh, and give the floor to Hans Peter. If I have for, forgotten something uh, or, or something important is, is in, uh, something is uh, important to add, please do it by yourself. And uh, I would give now the, the, the floor and the word for you. Thank you, Mario. Um, let me say something in advance to, to tell you what this all is about. Um, as Mayu said, we have a graduate school in Cologne, which every PhD student has to attend. That means there's one week with uh, lectures all over the day and 
um, the, the reason is that, and this is why I want to say this before I start, um, because I have perhaps, I'm not sure whether you are the same audience than the PhD students in Germany are. I know your topics and I know how you work. And so let me say something in advance. Um, in Germany, there is a, there is a general problem. Um, our education system um, leads young students to, uh, to solve cases. To, to they, they have this so-called case method and the state exams say you have to uh, um, have some uh, some tests and these tests five for five hours you have to solve a case a problem a case problem and that means that they use legal dogmatics a rather rational kind of reasoning to to solve this problem and they know the laws and they know what the judiciary says about this topic this is what what they are supposed to do that means we have not at all any scientific classes for students before that so they do not know anything about legal theory legal methodology not so much about legal history they they never thought about interdisciplinary working so um, they are not at all able to make a PhD. This is why we started this program. I think you do not have this problem, this problem in such a, such a strong way than we in Germany have. So perhaps many of the things I will tell you now are very simple to you. You know it already. You don't have this problem. We'll see. But it's, an, it's a simple way for PhD students in Germany to tell, tell them, is it of any use to work in legal history if you are willing to make a PhD in current law? So I'm not talking to those PhD students who are legal historians. A very small number, they are not the audience. The audience are us uh, PhD students who usually are not at all interested in legal history. So when I start this lecture, they always, in the beginning, they say, okay, this is the lecture we have to attend. Let's make legal history uh, uh, be gone. We have, to, we have to make it somehow okay. So, and I will start by giving you an example of an, a PhD, which was quite common, let's say 20 years ago in Germany. All right, so. So first question is why legal history? Very general uh, um, approach in the beginning. This could be a topic, and I will talk about this topic for the next 15 minutes. The unconscionability of spousal guarantees. We have a special German topic. There are um, wives giving a guarantee for, a, for their husband in, to a bank. The bank always wants the relatives to be a uh, um, guarantee and there was a special decision by the German Constitutional High Court, the Bundesverfassungsgericht, and they said in 1993 that these spousal guarantees are void because they are against the boni mores, the, their unconscionability. And so let's let's assume that we have a PhD which this which about this topic. So how could we do it? We start with an introduction, okay. Then we make a development, historical beginning. First we say, okay, how was this problem in Rome and in the Middle Ages? What was the problem there? Then we say, okay, how was it in the Jus Commune? In the Jus Commune, they had a special uh, German, uh, special Roman solution for this, the Senatus Consultum Velianum, and this was still uh, um, applied by German courts till the 19th century. So this would be the story of how Roman law went on till the 19th century. So then we could we look in some codifications, the Prussian ILR, Allgemeines Landrecht, the French Code Civil, which was in Germany in the in the Rhenish era, the codification, and the Austrian Allgemeine Bürgerliche Gesetzbuch. Then we say, okay, how is it in, in common law? 
how was it in the German civil code, the BGB? And then we say, okay, now this was history. Now we have the current issue. So how was it until 93 before this decision? And how, or what kind of decision was this then by the federal constitutional court in 1993? So this could be the outline of um, a PhD which, which, which is such a topic. My first question is, very general, why does one do this? Why do, if you, if you look in PhDs at the moment, I would say that such an outline is um, not so common anymore. If you look in German habilitation projects, the second book which you have to write to become a professor, it is very common to start like this. So let's talk about advantages and disadvantages, disadvantages of such an outline in your um, PhD. The first answer is consequence. Okay. What's the benefit? Why do PhD students do this? And my first answer would be very simple. Whoa, 100 pages done. So why do you do this? Okay, you write something down, then this sounds scientifically, it's history and it's all these books and all these strange languages you use. This seems to be very intelligent and very scientifically. Second answer. Now I will have an improved understanding of today's law. I want to warn you I do think that this is a very difficult answer. So let's talk about this second, this answer. Why is this perhaps not true? Let's talk about the outline again. First, he uses Rome and the Middle Ages. The answer could be, okay, why do we use Rome? Okay, simple answer. Rome is the source of everything. Everything comes from Rome, okay. But if you think about it, is it useful to say something about Rome? Sorry, Hazy. <laughs> the answer is, it depends. Let's say, oh my God. yeah, okay. I combine it with the second chapter. Is it useful to talk about the use commune spousal guarantees in the 19th century Senatus Consultum So is it useful to talk about this Roman Institute? Is it useful to understand more about the decision of the high constitutional court from the year 1993? Oh, sorry. And the answer would be, if you use these, or if you start with these questions, you have to answer, why has the Roman concept anything to do with our concept today? And this is not something which can be assumed by not, you have to argue for it. Rome is a totally different society. You do not have the freedom of contract law. Not everyone is able to make contracts. The property law system is totally different to Germany today. The guarantees in Rome were very difficult, different to what guarantees are today in Germany. So it's not something you, it's, or take the, take the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages are, the society in the Middle Ages is totally different to German society today. So what you have to answer here is before, or what usually is not answered in a PhD is, is it useful to talk about, talk about Rome? And if you want to prove this, I have to get into my English. I'm sorry, I'm too slow in my head at the moment. Um, 
Um, and if you want to prove this, you have to talk about, have to be aware that you talk about totally different contexts, totally different societies, totally different legal systems. It is not natural that the, especially that the living of a wife in Rome and their possibility and their enforcement perhaps to, to give a guarantee for her husband has anything to do with the the, the system or the problems of today's banks in the 20th century. Second view. Okay, now let's talk, let's talk about codifications. If you look in German PhDs, it's always the same codifications which, which come up. It's always the Prussian codification or with always the French codification. It's always the Austrian codification. It's never the Saxonian codification from 1866. So what you have to answer now is, <clears throat> why do I compare these codifications and not other codifications? It's not natural <clears throat> to use these codifications. In Germany, you have at least 20 different legal systems and you have more than these codifications. So next question would be, okay, why do I compare these codifications? Usually these questions is not answered. It's not even asked usually. Common law. I would say 40% of German PhDs in, especially in, uh, um, in, in uh, uh, um, company law, look to common law, especially to US law. What's the, what's the reason in our topic, spousal guarantees with common law? The first question would be, what influence, influence has common law to Germany? And the answer would be, there is almost no influence to Germany before 1945. So most of the German law was much more influenced by French law and Italian law than it was by US American law. So it's a very contemporary question to say, it has common law anything to do with that. And one, one more question, which has to be asked frankly, I think, I'm convinced that most German PhD students love US law, especially because it gives them a chance to visit Harvard or Stanford. And it's because they know the language. But the language can never be a reason to compare one's country. You have to compare the country which is the most important one, not the one which language you are able to speak. So first answer for this question, History means selection. There is no history of anything. You ask the sources, you decide what sources and you decide what history. History means selection and you are the selector and you always have to give reasons for the selection. And the problem is that usually nobody does it. Usually you take typical textbooks and you look, what do these books write about my topic? Usually contemporary legal history books. And that means you do not think about the question why this legal book or legal history book chose this source to talk about your topic. What's the perspective of this book? And if you do not do this, you're like a puppet on invisible strings. So you write forth what this author tells you, not knowing why he did tell this to you. One example, the most prominent legal history book in Germany that perhaps has ever been written since Savigny was written by Franz Wierke. Privatrechtste Geschichte der Neuzeit, translated in most, in many languages. 
this history of private law is a very political book. It's anti-positivistic, it's anti-liberal, it's perhaps a bit anti-democratic. There is a hidden history under this book. And if you do not think about this book, you're the servant of Franz Wierke still today. So the first question in the beginning of any historical part of a PhD has to be, what do I want to explain to whom, why, and using which old sources? It's a very difficult question, which you have to think about a lot. And in a PhD, you have to explain this question to your readers. If you do not do it, you're a naive believer in what others say about history. And behind this, there are some very difficult questions. The first is the question, can I learn from history? So if there were any problems with spousal guarantees in the 18th century, does this tell me anything for today? Historia docet Tacitus, you may know, learning from history. In Germany, it's typical today that most non-historians non try to say you can learn from history. But I would say in Germany, you will not find any historian who will underline this. I believe perhaps we cannot learn from history. That's not what history is about. One story, Marc Bloch, the famous French historian, wrote a book about the First World War. It's called The L'étrange Défaite, The Strange Defeat. He raises the question, why did the French lose the Second World War to the Germans? And his answer was, they believed in learning from history and this was false. He said, what was the First World War all about? There were troops, which the one offended and the second and the other defended. And they took cannons and bombed each other. And then there was, was most important to let them not pass the line, to give them no chance to, to get further. So they built up the Maginot line, learning from the First World War. The Maginot line was the stop sign for German troops and if anything would have gone like it went in the First World War, it would have worked, but times had changed. There were tanks and these tanks simply drove around and they almost were in Paris when they still waited in the Maginot line for the war to begin. So Marc Bloch said, French were bad historians because historians know that history never happens twice. It's always, the future will be always different to the past. And if this is true, the second question that has, has, this has been discussed in Germany also in the last 30 years quite intensively, then history is a very political tool. Historians tell stories about the past. And if these stories can never be true, they are always a kind of literature. And in the worst case, there are legends. They tell you something, the legend of the past, the legend of a people, the legend of a nation, the legend of the glory past and perhaps a glory future. So history and especially legal history always has to be aware that it is, can easily be a political tool. And what we try to do against this, yes, you have a question. Yes, if I may. Uh, Please. 
I have a question about this Franz Wieck uh, Privatrechtsgeschichte. Uh, you say that it's, it, it has become very popular and very much cited by PhD students in their works. But why so? Has it, uh, while it has a political or hidden political agenda and, and not a proper book for, for citing in serious um, science, as you say, uh, has it been written so well? Or, 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 or what is the reason then why it has gone viral? It's beautifully written but very difficult. If I'm honest, I would say they quote him because he is quoted somewhere else. They don't read him. Who's the mostly quoted legal historian if you take books which are older from the 80s or the 70s or 90s? It's always Franz Wierke. And if you're, and most PhD students, let's be honest, don't read the sources. They copy a footnote from someone else. So we always find these, these Franz Wierke quotations. And if I then in the, uh, uh, in the, the, more in the, in the, in the uh, oral exams, ask them, okay, why did you read Franz Wierke? And did, do you know what, what all this was about? They are always uh, shocked and say, no, 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 it was just this little quotation. So if you really want to read today Franz Wierke, I think most Germans, are not able anymore to read him because he was a specialist in his intellectual history. So he was very close to, to all the philosophers from the first part of, of the uh, 20th century, Heidegger, uh, uh, um, the, the phenomenologists, uh, uh, um, Reinach, uh, uh, all these, these, uh, uh, these forgotten thinkers. He all, he knew them. So he was, he was, a, it was another, another age, but I think, the thing is, they they use what they find. They do not look for them for it themselves. That's perhaps kind of the answer. So, if this is true, what I said, then the most important thing in the beginning is, I have to be aware. I have to select. So, how do I? organize my, my selection of questions and sources and answers. It's the research question in the beginning. This is, in my opinion, the most important part of a good PhD. The better the research question, the better is the PhD which goes on there. So let me give you some possible titles for a book. We have this title. The unconscionability of spousal guarantees. What do you say about it? Good title? Would you use it? Too general, I guess. Very general. It says nothing about times. Is it Rome? Is it France? What is it? It does not say anything about judiciary, about the, the question of the high constitutional court, for example much too general. That's not a question, that's a field. Also, uh, I think that it has pre uh, preconceptions or what is the correct word? It presumes. It presumes that it is unconscionable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's in that's a way, true. is that scientific enough if you that's have pres the presumption in the, in the heading already? That's true. I give you another title, The Overburdened Guarantor. Comments on the Federal Constitutional Court's case law regarding spousal guarantee. That's a title which is very often used in Germany if, if the PhD, if the, the author wants to sound like a, um, um, an author, like an, like an, uh, um, uh, um, he wants to sound more intelligent or more not so scientific, more uh, um, like a um, poet or something. Yeah, like an be a Schriftsteller. What's what's Schriftsteller, Verike? Uh, um, author, the writer. Right. Writer. Yeah. Yes. Writer. Yeah. The overburdened guarantor. I had a teacher who always used these two sentence titles. The first sentence is something very uh, um, 
very sensible. And the second title tells you what it's all about. The, the problem always was everyone only reads the first sentence and the second sentence is often not quoted. And uh, in, in searching machines, you often ha only have the first sentence. So you don't find these books. He had the problem with his PhD and this problem with his um, another book <clears throat> that, they, that everyone for the first book was um, <clears throat> uh, bad translation. Um, let's stop heritage law. And then the second sentence was uh, a, a discussion about the German civil code around 1900 in the context of blah, blah, blah. Everyone only reads the first title and say, okay, it's a political book about heritage law. He wants to stop it. He never, he, he says nothing about it. He says something about a discussion in the 19th century. So the title was totally misleading. <clears throat> okay. But anyway, we have the second sentence. Is that better? No, to me, it rem reminds the, the type of uh, titles that you can see in, in different uh, law journals. And uh, I think that this is also the impact that nowadays, you know, there are so many of these journals, different law reviews, and uh, our PhD students, they're also encouraged to publish. And so they are learning from, from what they are reading. And uh, so this is kind of really inspiring in the way. <laughs> Comments, comments is nothing. Comments means he will say something, whatever, what he thinks about it or what was historically going on. You have no idea what comments mean. It's a black box. It's not a scientific word. Another title. <clears throat> That's better, huh? But it's still descriptive what is being done instead of what is being researched. It's no question. It's only description of a field. It's no question. A description of the method, perhaps also. If, if that is, uh, if, if studying case law is a method, a practical method. Okay, but, perhaps. Mm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I give you a title, which I would say, which is good. Nobody uses such titles, but if you have such a title on your book, everyone knows what it's all about. That's a question. Why did the Federal Constitutional Court repeal long-standing case law of the German Supreme Court, the Buddhist Gerichtshof, on the unconscionability of spousal guarantees in 1993? That's a question. And you can see if you have such a precise question it's very easy to look for the answers. So what, what could be reasons for this? Why could the one court correct the other court? What could be reasons? I give you some possible reasons. The law had changed in 1993. Perhaps we have to look. Other courts had influences. Perhaps the, the, the U EU courts, or it could be influenced by other countries. Perhaps this court looked to other constitutional courts in France or whatever, could be a reason. Perhaps it was an inner judicial topic. So, were there some different styles in reasoning, for example? Were there some conflicts between these two courts? Was it, were there some conflicts between different senates in a court? Who decided this case? We will talk about it. Who were the judges? Where did they come from? How were they socialized? So what you would have to do now is if you just thought about this could be possible reasons. The thing you have to do now is to read the decision. So if we read the decision, 
having these questions in mind, we will find first approach to my topic, the law had not changed. There was not at all any international influence. But you will find such a text. Despite the insertion of a certain protection measures for weaker, despite the insertion of certain protection measures for weaker parties in legal re relation, the basic conception which the recreators of the BGB had in mind was that of formally equal, equal participants in legal relations. However, this conception had already been abandoned by the Reichsgericht, and it had been changed back to the material e ethic of social responsibility, a quotation of Franz Wierka, Industriegesellschaft and Privatis Ordnung 1974, page 24. Today, the court says, it is widely acknowledged that freedom of contract may only serve as an appropriate means for achieving a working balance of interests in cases where both parties have roughly, this, roughly the same bargaining power. And that one of the main responsibilities of the current private law is the equilibration of disrupted contractual party. Wide parts of the BGB may be seen in the light of this task. In this context, the general clauses within the BGB serve a crucial function. If you read this, you see this is very complicated. And what is even more interesting, this is very historic. They have a very historical approach. The High Constitutional Court tells us a, us a story. And they even tell us where they have it from. From Franz Wiecker, he told them this story as it seems in 1974, 20 years ago. So if you find something like this, I would say, now you need legal history. You have no chance to understand this decision without looking in legal history. They force you to be an historian, to understand their reason, their reasoning. So let's do that. This is approach two. We have to understand this picture. Where do they have it from? What do, do they want to say with that? So we have to read this paper and we will find that this paper is much older. It's from 1953. and was a lecture given to the Bundesgerichtshof, which is quoted here by the Bundesverfassungsgericht. So we have to read this. We have to understand this. We have to under, understand the context of this paper. What did Franz Wiercott want to say the court with this paper? Very complicated. They refer to general clauses, section 242 of the Bürgerliche Gesetzbuch. Treu und Glauben. I only have the French in mind, the bon foi. Uh, bon, bon, Good faith. They refer to good faith. So what has good faith to do with the high constitutional court? There is a concept in German law which says we use general clauses as a kind of gate for constitutional arguments into the civil law codification. And this concept of a gate has been developed in a certain judgment in 1958. This is the same time of Franz Wierka's lecture. This is the Lüth judgment. Every German law student knows this judgment of the High Constitutional Court. <clears throat> so this was all, all was important to them. This is a special argument in this reason. And they, they say about say something about materialization. In the 1990s, there was a debate. 
you do not you you don't have to know this at all but there was a debate by Klaus Wilhelm Canaris and other authors in Germany and they debated whether private law had changed in the 20th century from a formal to a more material way this is these are words given by uh, um, Max Weber and he differentiates between a formal way of legal thinking and a material way of legal thinking. This material way of legal thinking is a more free way according to justice. And arguing, arguing with good faith in this story is something which came up in the 20th century. The judges more and more use good faith and that means justice arguments and not so much arguments which are very precisely given by the law. So they try to get rid of the law and have a more free arguing. So this is the context. This is what you have to understand to understand what the judges did here. So that forces you to make legal history. Approach three. Now it is interesting for us to see why did they use these texts? Why was the text almost 40 years old in 1993, still so important to these judges? So we get, no, we get closer to the Senate who decided this case. Which judges were present in the Senate? How were they shaped? Where did they come from? Where did they study? Did they know Franz Vierke? Did they read him? Were there some leading figures? I will talk about this a bit more. We know that, for example, Konrad Hesse was the most important judge of the high, uh, high constitutional court in Germany in the 80s. He shaped our constitutional law. So what was the Senate? Was there somebody, somebody sitting there who was the most important figure? Then we have to get closer to him. We have to, go to, we have to know him to understand the decision. So, whether it is of any use to use legal history has to be evaluated by the author in any specific case. I try to show you a case where I think you are forced to think as a legal historian because the topic forces you to go into legal history. The question you gave to the source gives by the source an answer and this answer forces you to understand the source to make legal history. So I would say it is very appropriate and you're almost forced to do this if the sources gives you questions which you have to answer by legal history. So if a study cannot be understood without historical background, you have to make legal history, that's easy. If the sources do not force you to do this, I would say there's no reason to make legal history. You do not kind, you do not need any kind of introductionary history. There's no reason to start your PhD with making legal history. Only if the question forces you to do that, do so. Okay. Any questions for now? Okay. Now I want to give you six possible themes for using legal history in PhDs. The first question will be, is it of any use to make a historic interpretation of the written law? The second question will be, or the second topic will be, are you able to understand old norms and judgments better if you work with legal history? The third thing will be, I think 
if you think historically, you will become new into new interesting questions. It will trigger you. I will show you some examples. It is better to understand traditions in legal thinking if you use legal history to understand that. The decision which we just had was one example. I think historians are, if you as an historian never believe in the ability to learn from history, it, it is much easier to get rid of history. So not to say we did this for such a long time, so we have to go on like this. You would never do this as a historian. It gives you freedom. I will show you an example. And the other, the last possible use of legal history is very unhistorically. You can just use it as a mass of ideas. And then you get rid of all the context and all the people who said that, no, it's not, a, no, not important. There, you find simply some good ideas in history and you use them today without saying anything about history. If you give a lecture as a legal historian in Germany, everyone expects you to be a fan of historical interpretation of the law. I'm not. We call it subjective interpretation. The opposite is objective interpretation. In Germany, you may know, we have four interpretation methods. Historically, um, grammatically by the wordings, systematically and teleologically by the reason. These four methods are always in conflict with, which is with each other. In Germany, you would say, which is the most important uh, a way of interpreting the law, in Germany we say the teleological, for the zweck, for the reason of the law we ask. The others are not so important, especially the wording is not important at all, this, the history is not important at all, the systematic is sometimes important. And let's just have some quotations of very famous um, civil lawyers in Germany today, what do they say about history, historical interpretation? And they say, no, that's, that's rubbish. Volker Beutin says, legislators conceptions and motiv motives are only binding with regard to the application of the law to the degree that they are convincing to an objective level. It means they are not binding at all. If the historical legislature says A and I say, I'm not convinced, then I make B. So this is not an important way of interpreting the law. Perhaps the one of the five most important civil lawyers today in Germany, Gerhard Wagner said 2002, does not reflect any credit on German legal scholarship if its energy is used not on normative questions on fact, but on the hermeneutics of the legal journal that publishes new legislation. So he says, only non, not intelligent lawyers make historical interpretation. So historical interpretation is not loved in Germany, not at all. Is this a bad thing? Especially, Is it against the law? Because you must know that if you do not make any historical interpretation, that means you're not interested in the will of the legislator. You do not want to know what they wanted. You only use the wordings, but you, you're, you're not interested in what was behind these wordings. And this is common opinion in Germany today. No one's interested in what the legislator really wanted. The first answer is, 
it is within the law to argue exactly like this, like this. So to ignore the historical sources of, lit, of the legislator. Why is that so? The parliament only decided about the wordings. It never decides about the motives. Usually they do not even know them. So there's one decision in the legislation and decision is about the words. And it's interesting that in legal history, there were other solutions. There were solutions where you have to use other sources than the codification, the so-called interpretatio authentica. There were second books which you had to use to interpret the codification. An authoritative commentary to the written law. We had this in Germany, for example, in the Bavarian law in the 18th century. In Sweden, you know this better than me, but I heard this by French colleagues. It is still so that the legislator decides about the motives too, not only about the text of the codification or of the law. So the motives never pass legislation, so they never can be binding. So it's very correct not to bind oneself on motives which are not um, authorized by the legislator. But is it of any is it any problem? It would not be a problem if the wordings of the norms are so precise that we read the text and we are able to know what the legislator wanted. This is the, the old parami, in claris not fin interpretatio, use commune, clear wordings are not to be interpreted. In the US, you may know the plain meaning rule. You have to interpret it by the plain meaning of the wordings. I don't know how it is in Estonia, in Germany, the scientific, the um, philology, the um, science of uh, um, linguistics work quite close together with jurists. So we are quite informed how the science nowadays think about hermeneutics and thinks about the possibility to understand words in the, same, in the same way. And in Germany, we say there is not a single word in German language which is out of interpretation. Every word can be understood different. There's not a single word which is precise. I give you one, one example, a famous decision by the German High Constitutional Court. When I was finishing school, I had to attend military service. The alternative was to make civil service, to say, I do not want to go to the army. There was a different length, 18 month military service or 24 month civil service. And in our constitution, there was an article and this article says, the civil service must not be longer than the military service. So somebody said, okay, but the civil service is 24 months and the military service is 18 months, this is longer. So we went to the high constitutional court and everyone in Germany said, that's a very simple decision. 24 is longer than 18. And the high constitutional court said, there is a kind of it's not only a quantitative question time, it can also be a qualitative question. They said the time in the military service is more intense. You have less freedom while you are there. 
You're very close together with the other soldiers. It's a more intensive time. You do not have the possibility just to drink a coffee or something with your, which you have if you work for elderly people. And then they said 18 month military service is as long as 24 month civil service. So not even time, not even 24 to 18 is precise. Even time was, it was even with time, it was possible to interpret in different ways. So in Germany, we say, we do not want to know what the historical legislator wanted. The wordings are not able to bind us. And on the other hand, we have a separation of power. So the judge is, the force, is forced to do what the legislator wants him, but it does not seem to work. So in this context, what's the reason of historical interpretation? That's, we can skip this. I think it's a rationalization. It does not bind you at all. You do not, uh, you are not forced to do what they wanted. That would be wrong. But the, if you understand what they wanted, you can differentiate between two things. You can differentiate between what they wanted and what we today do. That means you can differentiate between applying and uploading the law. So did the judges change the law? So then we have judge made law. So we are bind perhaps to judge made law in Germany, not anymore to the codification. If you do not do this, it's an, it's an unseparatable mixture of the law, decisions of the courts, and all this makes the law in a way. And if you differentiate between, you say, this is what they wanted and this is what we do, you're, it's much easier to criticize because then you can say, okay, this was the original law. This is what they wanted. The judges did something else. Are they allowed to do this? Yes, in certain ways, they are allowed to do this. But what I, what I do now do is not, I criticize the legislator, I criticize judiciary. And that means I need arguments which are allowed to criticize judiciary. So the only reason, in my opinion, of historical interpretation is you are able to understand what they wanted. That does not bind you, but that gives you the chance to say, this is what we do, and this is what they wanted us to do. This is a separation, and it gives you a more rational way of criticizing the law. So it's not much, historic interpretation does not bind you at all, but it gives you a kind of rationalization of the discourse. Second, improved understanding of old norms and judgments. Judgments always refer to a certain context. They react to something. They have a problem and then the judgments or the, the norms react to such a problem. This is something Savigny already talked about. If you want to understand a norm, you have to understand the problem. And if the problem, if the norm is old, the problem is also very old. And if you find the problem and you understand the norm, then you know, okay, this is what this norm was about. It was about to solve this problem. And if you go on in times and you say, okay, oops, the problem gets lost, but we still have this norm, then you have to say, okay, the norm has changed. It may be dead law now because the problem is gone or a norm which had been developed for a certain problem now reacts to another problem, to, to a problem which was never, which, which is never had been planned for. One example. In Germany, we have a very strict liability for the car owners, not only for the car drivers. So in many cases, the owner of a car is liable for something a driver does. My son uses my car and I'm liable for it because I'm the owner. Where does this come from? This strange concept. It's against 
the law usually we do not have a concept that you are liable for someone else because you own something but we have it with cars why do we have it with cars it's it came up in 1900 and in 1900 it was usually so that the car owners never drove the car so if they had separated the liability for the for the owner to the liability of the car driver you would always have very poor drivers having to pay this sum which they could not do they were chauffeurs so it is in my opinion it's a good example to understand what this norm is about and then you can say okay times have changed we do not have chauffeurs now the owners drive the car so perhaps this old this whole concept should be thought over again should be thought over again Better understanding of the norms, norms in general. Usually, I, I start this lecture in Germany by saying to the students, I expect that you are not at all interested in history. You did never like history. You say history is boring, it's dead. So, on the other hand, Everything you write about has already happened. So everything you write about is history. But you do not think as historians. You think as jurists. And jurists think there is no first then. Jurists think everything happens in the same second. A typical German footnote is this. This is judiciary. First, we have the RGZ, the Reichsgericht. This is the German High Court in, in civil law till 1945. Then we have the OGHZ, Oberste Gerichtshof für die Britische Zone. Most German students never heard this. This was a court we had for four years in Germany between the Reichsgericht and the Bundesgerichtshof. Then 1950, BGH set starts. Then we have two decisions of the Bundesgerichtshof, the High Court of today. Jurists use this to say, they all have the same opinion. So many court decisions say this, so I have a very strong argument. Customary law. But what is this about? If we think, if we look a bit closer to this, footnote we will find lawyers think unhistorically what could be the reason to to change this could it be of any use to say no this is all history but we don't do not work with this with it as historians but perhaps we could and if we would do would this be would this be interesting could we learn something which we do not learn as jurists i will try to show you The first decision is bad because it's it's 1899. You did not find this, but it's before the, the code we have today has come in force. So it's of an older law. So it's it's stupid to, to have this in your quotation because it's about an older law. The second quotation, oops, is national socialism. Not a good quotation, you would say. Huh? I did not see this, sorry. The next quotation is this very special court, the Oberste Gerichtshof. It has a very special duty. It was the only court in Germany which was not um, organized by national socialists. The Bundesgerichtshof had, most of them were national socialists, were old national socialists, still judges. Not this court. There was not one national socialist as a judge. It was a spe very special court. So if you read the decisions, you should know this. You should know what was their kind of reasoning. And now we have a decision of the Bundesgerichtshof 1951. It was a special, very special time of the Bundesgerichtshof. The only time German judges said we have natural law. They had a kind of Christian natural law, especially in family law. They were, if you read the decisions today, they were almost crazy with their, with their special kind of Christianity in natural law far away from the constitution a very rigid uh, um, uh, um, 
rigid way of family law thinking. What we know today is German law changed when the wall fell down, when the GDR collapsed. This is what we, at the, at the moment, there are quite some uh, um, resources, uh, 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 um, quite some, uh, um, my English is gone, going. Um, there are quite some uh, um, projects at the moment to try to find out what changed Germany when the wall fell down. But we know something, we know something, for example, that some laws from the GDR changed the German, the uni United German law very strongly. So the GDR did not only collapse, it changed our way of legal thinking in many parts. Family law, for example, criminal law, for example. There are many things from the socialist system coming to Germany. So you should know this if you read all, the, all these decisions. It's a, it's a decision from a special time. And if we go on asking like this, then you could say, okay, how does such a chain, usually what do, do German students do? They find this chain in a commentary, these 10 decisions, they, they never read them. They find this chain and take it in their own footnote and say, oh, this is a good chain, very good. They don't read it. They do not know where these, these uh, decisions come from. And they do not even know where this chain comes from. It is very interesting. How do judges work? In Germany, they have books nobody knows, so-called reference guides. Guides. They were published some 10 years ago. Every court has a hidden book. And this hidden book, in this hidden book, the, the judges say, we have a very important decision which we should take into this book. And every judge can use this book, but no one knows it. It's an unpublished book. So if you want to know how judges think, you, are, you must not think that they use the typical journals you know. They have a special book. And in this book, there are decisions which perhaps are not published. But these decisions may be the one which were most important to the judges. And on the other hand, you must know, especially today, the judges of the high courts in Germany have full access to all unpublished judgments. So we have a separated discourse. The judges know all decisions. We only know some decisions. And we always think the judges, as we do, have the same decisions. No, they have many more decisions. They have other decisions. They have other, other, other leading decisions even. So historical thinking leads you to new, new questions I want to show you here. The last question, which has been, we talked about this already uh, in another uh, um, lecture when you were the teacher and taught me your topics. In Germany, well, there was a very strong movement which says judiciary has not been thought about only by the, by the uh, uh, decisions. It has to be thought about the judges. The judges are the most important figures. So we have to know much more about the judges. I don't know how it is in Estonian judge, uh, judges or in Estonian courts in Germany. We have two separated kinds of court thinking. We have the Bundesgerichtshof, the High Court for Civil Law. Nobody knows any judge. It's a black box. If you ask a student, do you know any judge? No, never heard. There are only senates, but even, even professors do not know the, the important persons of the, of the senates. Totally different, Bundesverfassungsgericht, High Constitutional Court. Every German jurist knows the most important judges there. It's because the High Constitutional Court is built after the Supreme Court after 1949 in Germany. This was what's what we were looking at in these days. We're looking to the US. So it's a very politicized court. 
So in this court, he would always say the, he's left wing, he's right wing, he's to this party as as the Supreme Court. In all other courts, we think no, this is just just uh, lawmaking by uh, figures we do not have to know. It's a kind of objective way of legal reasoning, which is absolute untrue. So in the last years, more and more the judges came into interest. It started with the High Constitutional Court, the Bundesverfassungsgericht. There's a very strong movement, very, very detailed uh, um, workings about uh, the Senates in special times. And the Bundesgerichtshof is coming more and more interesting in the last years. So, for example, important, some important figures. We know that the so-called natural law renaissance of the Bundesgerichtshof is mainly shaped by one person. There was one very Christian president of the Bundesgerichtshof, Hermann Weinkauf. He shaped two senates of the Bundesgerichtshof for 10 years. He was a very strong judge. German family law in the 50s was very strongly shaped by one person, Hermann Weinkauf. Another very important person is Günther Dürig. He was a professor in Tübingen. He was not a judge, but he was in the 50s most important for the Bundesverfassungsgericht. He shaped the Lüth decide decision. That this was the decision co uh, um, about the about the, the um, um, well, about civil law and constitutional law, and how constitutional law is. Is, uh, is influencing uh, um, the private law. The last one, we think the most important judge in Bundesverfassungsgericht, I told you already, is Konrad Hesse. He was a judge there for 12 years and he made many of the main decisions we still have. You do not, it, I do not want to tell you these names. I just want to tell you that it is important to think about such names to know something about the courts. Fourth, I will tell you about my PhD. This is very dangerous because um, I would never have started such a PhD today again. This was a great mistake, much too complicated for such a young scholar. But I was um, willing to do this because I had written this in a very famous commentary, and it still is there. You see my PhD did not change, change anything. It still is in this commentary, this sentence, which I think is a scandal. Concept, it's about good faith. Section 242, this is the section of good faith in the Bürgerliche Gesetzbuch. Concept of good faith creates an imminent restriction of content in all areas of law, the so-called Innen theory, inner theory. The application of law in a way that conflicts with good faith, as well as the exploitation of a certain legal position, are seen improper transgressions of the law. This improper application of the law may become appropriate again once the determining circumstances change. Likewise, a change of circumstances may affect that an application of the law which was once appropriate, now turns improper. Section 242 thus creates a relatively relativity of the content of the law. This is very abstract. But if you think about it, what does it mean? It means you have a position, a claim, for example. And this claim is given to you by a contract or by the law. And neither the law nor the contract says anything against your claim. But your claim is against good faith. And even if the law gives you this claim, good faith is able to stop your claim. Good faith is higher than any norm. Good faith is higher than any claim given by a contract, says this text. And what is even more problematic is, this text says, if you're, you have this claim and you use it, and you use it or, or while using this claim, it's against good faith. 
then you lose your claim without any additional thing. Just good faith takes you the claim away. And if you use the same, your property, for example, in a better way, you get this property again. So the text says, if you're an owner of something and you, you use your property and you use it against good faith, you are not an owner anymore in this second. You have lost your property only because good faith has the ability, ability to do this. This sentence by far is against the German constitution, but there is nothing said about constitution here. So this sentence is, I would say, still today is a scandal and it can't be true. It can't be true that good faith is the God of everything in Germany. This can't be true because we know that good faith is a black box. Good faith is nothing. Good faith is the ability of a judge to say, I like it or I like it not, nothing else. So I was interested, how can such a sentence come into the most famous, this is the most prominent commentary in Germany. Every lawyer has the parlant, the so-called parlant on his table in Germany, every. So how can this, can this come? So I went back this commentary to the 50s. There I read something. The courts have broken up the working years, the working years ago, and they have inferred from 242, this is our statute, the basic principle which dominates the entire legal life. There you can find it. Namely that everyone has to act in line with good faith in the exercise of his rights and duties. The exercise of the law, abuse of law is the topic here in English. The exercise of the law in all those cases, a transgression of the law is in all these, in all those cases, a transgression of the law. This is the internal, internal theory. And it seems like acting without the law. You say something against the good faith principle and now you're against the law, you lost the law. This boundary of law is a consequence of the duty inherent in every right. Okay. Hence the content of the general principle is that right and duty are infiltrated with the idea of the connection of the legal partners with themselves, idea of faithfulness in the stricter sense. Very complicated. Let's go over this. But also their connection, this sounds more interesting, with the general public and the specific community. So what is the what is good faith all about? They say good faith is something between the partners of a contract, for example, but good faith is also something which interests the public. Why should the public be interested in good faith? Then they say, when the Reichsgericht spoke of the idea of community and the Volksgemeinschaft, the terminology is influenced in a national socialist way, but the underlying idea may be affirmed. Benchmark the prevailing opinion within society. They say, okay, why did we did, did we do this? Why did the Reichsgericht do this? They did this because, or why did they use good faith as a general principle, which is higher than any norm or any contract? And they say, we did this because we wanted to get public interest stronger in private law. Public interest should be able to infiltrate contracts and the law. And then the wording is the Volksgemeinschaft. This is national socialist. And they say, yes, it's, it comes from a national socialist, this idea, but it's not, not bad. We can still use it. I went one further, 1940. Now we are in the national socialist time. And now I found the identic wordings. So we just took it over. The courts have broken up the wording. This is like we read. And the second part is interesting. The precise context of the basic principle is determined not primarily, primarily by the views of the parties to the contract, but by values of national people, the Volksgemeinschaft. Benchmark ruling now national socialist ideology. 
So this concept we still have today in our parliament was developed in the national socialism to infiltrate private law by national socialist concepts. So, and you only find it out by going back to the sources. And you will see, they just wrote it down. They just took the idea without thinking about it. So now today we have something in the parliament which is against the constitution, but it's simply there because everyone read what is further, what the further author had written. And he took parts of it or he took it all over as we saw in this two, uh, um, between 1940 and 1951. Has this become clear with my, my vanishing English? Okay, we are always through. So if you, if you understand that, that this idea we just learned about is national socialist, it's very easy to say, let's change it. It's of no, it does not bind me at all that the most prominent commentary in Germany uh, still has this concept. I say, yes, but it's an historical concept. Times are over, let's change it. I think history does not bind you. It gives you freedom to change. And last, idea. In Germany, we have some problems which are discussed over 2000 years now. And I think a very good way to look to use Roman law still today is as a resource of ideas. Very still some of the German most prominent civil lawyers which are very good in legal dogmatics, they are very good in Roman law. So I would say the Romans had a good idea here. So I would say, and this is an unhistorical way of thinking. You say, I do not care about the context. I do not care what it was about in Rome. This is an historical thinking. I do not care, but we have a similar, a similar problem today and they had a very good solution. Let's use it. Okay, these were the six ways of using legal theory, uh, legal history. And one last thing. In Germany, I would never say that this means that if you have such a question that you should become a legal historian. This is not so easy. I think it's also a, quine, a question of the division of labor. So this is why I give the German PhD students, some sources, which I think are the best in the 20th century to know something about <clears throat> the law of a time. These sources will be totally different in Estonia, but we have some interesting uh, um, sources in Germany. The best sources, if you want to know about, about 19th century in Germany are the preliminary drafts of the Bürgerliche Gesetzbuch. When the Bürgerliche Gesetzbuch started, they say, okay, in the beginning, we need books which compare all the different solutions which are going on in Germany nowadays. So you have one problem and you have 20 solutions. And these books are the best books to know something about 19th century private law in Germany. You may know it, we have a special commentary. Most legal historians in Germany were authors in this Historical critical commentary, historisch kritische Kommentar zum BGB. Every section of the BGB is developed from Rome till today in a history of legal dogmatics. And one forbidden but very interesting source. In Germany, the time where most German professors, which were not uh, um, which were not uh, um, driven away by the National Socialists, which had uh, kept in which which uh, um, kept their their chair, were part of the so-called Akademie für Deutsches Recht. Between 1930 
1904 and 1942. In Germany, this Akademie für Deutsches Recht was a kind of think tank and a mixture between national socialist concepts and concepts which were older and well, this, which had been discussed for a long time. What is important is, in this is most of the scholars in Germany, which were prominent till I would say the 1990s in Germany, Klaus Wilhelm Canaris, Karl Lahrens, so many of them, they were all influenced by the thinking of these years. So if you want to know something about German private law in the Bundesrepublik until 1990, you have to know where they came from. And this is what was their think tank. When they were a very young man, they learned about private law in this academy for Deutsches Recht. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, uh, uh, I am very impressed and, and very happy. You, you was ready to, to prepare uh, uh, this presentation for, for our audience uh, also in, in, in English. So I, I'm sure we have a lot of questions and uh, I will give the floor free for, for questions or comments. Or... Matis, please. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I really enjoyed this lecture. I'm not a historian, and I, I was curio curious to, um, to listen to you because Mario advertised you uh, as one of the uh, best uh, legal historians in the world. So uh, <laughs> I was, that's why no. I, would, I would start with, with, with this question um, uh, that uh, could you explain briefly um, uh, what is the um, method of history, or more precisely, legal history? <laughs> Briefly. <laughs> First answer, there is no method of legal history. There are methods, and there are very competi competitive schools and uh, um, groups which are part of a certain method which try to think in a special way about legal history. The famous or the, the main groups are, the there is one group which um, makes legal history quite similar to Savigny did. So they, they think what's, it's the history of norms and concepts and legal dogmatics. And they use a concept over 200 years to see its development without the context without the society which is around, it's only the problem and the solution. This is very prominent. And then I tell you no name, you may know Reinhard Zimmermann, for example, he works like this. And the scholars of Reinhard Zimmermann, which are still quite prominent in Germany at the moment. There's another group which say, this is totally false. This is a method, with, with, this is a scientifically uh, um, unprecise and uh, um, wrong method because, um, if you make legal history like this, you're not able to do any, to say anything about reality. It's a kind of uh, um, fantasy discourse in the skies about between some scholars over the centuries, which did not even, even know each other, but they wrote about the same Roman source in the digest, for example. So they are the, the legal historians who work very close to contemporary civil law. The other group is much closer to historians and they say it's all about context. So every uh, legal problem has to be uh, um, seen into its context, into its, uh, um, into its uh, um, into its, uh, into, its, into its context. So that means, um, that Roman law is totally different to everything that came behind because the Roman uh, society had totally different concepts and was totally different in its uh, um, separation between the groups and so on. So um, then you have in this, in this historical uh, group, you have subdivisions, if you say, you have a very strong intellectual history going on at the moment anymore. Uh, um, so it's about the history of legal science, the history of legal 
thinking of uh, uh, um, philosophy of legal theory. This is a strong movement at the moment. For example, at the Max Planck Institute, there is moment uh, at the moment in Frankfurt, uh, Marietta Auer starting, and she has a kind of legal history which makes, uh, which has uh, it's a kind of intellectual history, very, very philosophical, very abstract. The history of liberalism and the history of uh, freedom, of Kantianism, of Hegelianism, like this, and. Um, and you have a very strong uh, social history, for example. They made they some history about the workers and the workers, the, the uh, workers and their law, and, and also all, all that. So you have different groups, and they all have. Uh, they are one group is you could say in the in the still close to Savigny. The other groups are close to really uh, um, methodological groups in, uh, within the historians. Historians are separate in Germany. You have very strong social history, but you also have very strong groups coming up at the moment. Social history is going back at the moment. So these are perhaps the main groups. Johannes, please. Uh, I'd also like to thank you for very interesting and um, well, lively presentation, I must say. Um, and it, it intrigued me in, in many ways. Uh, well, first, maybe, well, the Balant comment, uh, maybe it's more specific to Germany, but, but to me, uh, it was interesting to, to hear about the evolution of the idea and the comment. And, um, and um, so I, d I think history may uh, repeat itself and um, the social content of uh, the private law concept may may come back again or so it, it can't be excluded just it will repeat itself in a in a, in a new form <clears throat> well anyway what i wanted to ask was about uh, you uh, uh, brought some examples of very influential um, uh, uh, top judiciary uh, like weinkauf and durich and and hesse and um, has has the, this trend of research been somehow influenced by um, uh, the legal realism? And how old is the this this tradition in Germany to investigate or, or to research and study the backgrounds of judges and their influence on the development of uh, of the law? In Germany, many still uh, uh, tend to say legal realism is nothing from the U.S. It's a German movement. It's around 1900. It's the free law movement. They were very strong in this. Hermann Kantorowicz, for example, he went to the U.S. and criticized the the uh, the realists, the Valen, and, and all all these. Um, um, so uh, this movement is quite old. But um, what is true is that um, the uh, constitutional lawyers who work like this, they have a special uh, theory behind, and the theory behind is. Uh, um, there is no binding law. There is no legal dogmatics. Is uh, does can never bind the judge. So the judge is doing what the judge wants to do. This is the theory behind. But it's not so much as the realists to say this is uh, power and this is social power of a special group. And and this uh, we had this very strong in the seventies, for example, where very left wing lawyers say this is simply the power of a certain group of people, and we should uh, vote. Uh, judges and, and, and these questions. Uh, no, they say it's quite, it's, it's more a methodological question. Uh, how do, does a judge decide? And they say, he never decides by the law or by the concept. He always uses the concept for an argumentation he already has. So we had, this was a movement um, by hermeneutics, Hans-Georg Gadamer was, uh, was very strong in the 60s in Germany. And we have some legal theorists like, like um, Josef Esser, for example, and they say Vorverständnis and Methodenwahl. That means first you have a, 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 an intuitive decision and then you use the method to make the reason for it. And if you think like this, you have to say, okay, what's this intuitive reaction the judge does? And then you say, okay, we have to talk about the judge. Where does it come from? How, how was his socialization? Well, what were his parents? Where did he study? Who influenced him? And all that.
Can I? Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I was just uh, when you when you uh, were talking, I was I was drawing parallels to what uh, the judges in Estonia do, or or uh, you know uh, what kind of uh, interpretation methods would be acceptable in Estonia. And, and um, my view is that actually we are using quite a lot of historical uh, interpretation methods in Estonia. For example, uh, in the constitutional review. Uh, uh, procedures, we quite often ask what the intent of the legislator was. And this intent quite often is not clear from the wording of the law itself. But we go back to the history and we go back to the uh, sources. So, so I would, um, I would uh, if I were a PhD student, I would, I would take probably um, the criticism that you make for the for the use of different methods with pinch of salt because it it is I think quite dependent on the legal culture of a particular uh, country. Thus, uh, uh, thus, uh, and of course, then then uh, this brings us, especially when you when you deal with with comparative legal methods on the side with the with the historical methods, then then of course you are in trouble because because presumably it might be quite difficult for you to understand what the others, uh, or what the tradition in the, in the country where, where you compare with, uh, with are. And especially I think Estonian lawyers are very keen in looking at the uh, German uh, court decisions and, and in German commentary. And I think that without you know, understanding the method of interpretation, it is very difficult to draw conclusions uh, to the other legal culture and 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 learn for Estonia so but it was I don't have a question it is just a, you know this kind of observation and and I think that in a way we sometimes perhaps are not critical enough or uh, are not conceptualizing enough when 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 we use other other sources or uh, borrow from from international law or borrow from other countries yeah thank you um, in 2000, we had a, um, a we we had two celebrations: 100 years Bürgerliche Gesetzbuch and 50 years the Bundesgerichtshof. And the German professors gave up gave out they published four celebration books for the Bundesgerichtshof, four four books. Not one for the Bundesgerichtshof. The French at the Bicentenaire in 2006, there was a huge feast given by the state for the Code Civil. We did not make anything for the Bürgerliche Gesetzbuch. So it's all a question of culture. And the interesting question is, when did we lose our trust in the legislature? And this has something to do with a very old culture because in the 19th century, legal science felt itself very independent about the against the constitute the, the legislature, because the legislature then at Savinis time was only in territories but not in the state. There was no state. We did not have a national state. So the law they used was was to use commune, a law without a legislature. So this this uh, um, this feeling of being free of, of being forced by the legislator is very old. On the other hand, it's Germans lost the belief in the legislator very strong in the First World War and in the Weimar Republic. These were the times of the huge crisis, economically crisis in Germany. And the legislator produced masses of laws and was never able to solve any problem. There was a black market and this black market was all it was all about this black market and all that all the state tried to do uh, a legal market never worked so the state failed totally at least i, I, I think this the legis the, the belief in the legislature in germany never came back and when we had the, the last ch great change of the burgerly exit in 2001 there were profess professors producing this law so they did not even believe in itself in a way. They did not even give us the motives. So if you want to know what they wanted to do, they did not 
write down anything. So if you know somebody who was part of the group, you invite him to, to a dinner and he will tell you, or she will tell you, we have one in our faculty. I always went to eat with her to know what they wanted to do. And then she said, hey, but the other one who was part of the group said, no, 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 we did not. We wanted something totally different. So they were discussing about what they wanted, but they did not want to write it down. So you see, not even them were willing to give us the chance to make historical interpretation. Yes. Matis, please. Um, perhaps a, a few, few words uh, to my background, because uh, to understand the question better, I'm a constitutional lawyer and um, I'm, um, uh, my methodological background is uh, Robert Alexi and his uh, discourse theory. And I think um, uh, in, in this, from this background, I would like to oppose you because you said um, you came up with these uh, Savini's methods of interpretation, the four ones, and you said the most important one is, is uh, teleological interpretation, which is, um, it might be even true for the private law, but um, in the constitutional law and in the, in the public law, uh, this is not true because uh, of course the, the general practical arguments uh, uh, that um, are actually the, the teleological uh, if, um, the interpretation, um, they are the least important arguments. And I would, I would like to um, uh, add a comment to, to my dear colleague, Katri Lohama, who uh, just uh, made her com comment just before me, is that um, we, we perhaps shouldn't um, uh, uh, mix up the, the, the historical interpretation and the genetic interpretation, because uh, what the legislator wanted is either the uh, subjective teleological interpretation or genetic interpretation, but this is not historical interpretation. Historical interpretation is, I think, the, um, as Savini understood it as well, um, as something, um, the history that what I asked before, what is the method? How can we know? According to Alexei, it is of course one of one um, sub part of, of systematic interpretation when we uh, are trying to, to create system in the dimension of time. And it is very similar to the interpretation, um, uh, comparative interpretation where we are trying to create system uh, across the borders. So um, it is perhaps a comment, not really a question. <laughs> I think it's very interesting to, to uh, differentiate between genetic and historical interpretation, but this is Robert Alexi. I mean, this is a, a, a way of argumentation method, which uh, I would say is in foreign countries much more influential than in Germany. I do not know so many, uh, um, but you may correct me. But uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, um, the friends of mine who are very uh, who are working in constitutional law would never say that they are scholars of, of Robert Alexi. So it's a special, it's a group, it's a school, I would say. And uh, um, uh, so uh, the, the typical meaning of historical interpretation, subjective interpretation is what I gave you. Uh, um, you, can, you could differentiate between, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a way of interpretation method thinking. So it's a methodological question we could discuss. Yes. Um, yes, that's it. Honest, please. I also, I, I rather have a comment and, and comment on Katra's uh, comment uh, where you said that in Estonia, we are more eager to use historical methods, uh, but it's perhaps because we have shorter history and we still remember uh, when the acts were legislated, we have only, well, the oldest uh, laws we have, we apply today are 30 years old and not older. Uh, 
<clears throat> while in Germany, well, you have a bit unfortunate history. You have had the interruption, the National Socialist period, perhaps plus the, the Weimar, the weakness of the legislative power at the time. So that might have sort of um, infected <laughs> the system and, 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 and the thinking of, of people. And so you're maybe a bit too sensitive about uh, historical arguments or, I mean, lawyers generally maybe. Uh, while in Estonia, yeah, we, we also had an interruption uh, much longer than you had, but uh, we haven't inherited anything from the pre-war time. <clears throat> it's all uh, only well intellectual what what we what we see today, even the constitutional law. But uh, yeah, so that's why um, you know, in Estonia we do go as practicing lawyers. We do go back to the uh, explanatory memoranda and um, and we, we we check up the the thinking of the legislator and the lawmakers. And that's true. But I also agree with Katre that uh, on the uh, comparative law, we are not that strong. We have copied a lot from Germany or we try to copy, uh, but uh, maybe it's half done. And, and of course, the knowledge of Germany is vanishing. And uh, I think there are fewer and fewer lawyers who are capable of, <laughs> of even understanding German law. Well, so that's why the, the Anglo-Saxon law and, and thinking is probably um, taking over the comparative law arguments. But again, that was just a comment. Yes, yes. Um, um, I think it has something a lot to do with uh, the trust in a legislator, and I think you you um, think it's your legislator. You you like him in a, in a way. It's you you sozusagen you you think positive about him. This is in Germany. Um, what is interesting is if we have a German uh, law like the Schuldrechtsreform from two thousand one, we are not interested what they wanted. It's not old. But still, we are not interested. If you take the BGB from 1900, okay, it's, it's, it, it sounds absurd, absurd to, to want to know what they wanted in 1896. But if you say we are not even interested in 2001, but we are always interested in EU law. We always make a very close historical interpretation of EU law. Because um, we, I would, you would say, we do not like EU law also. But we do not understand it, so we 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 try to get rid in the EU law to by interpreting it by in a historical way, which we do not try in with German law. Yeah, I think you make a very good point. In Estonia, we have much fewer arguments in uh, legal interpretation. That's why perhaps going back to explanatory memoranda and and the legislators' arguments is a more natural way and or perhaps the only way of finding any arguments. While in Germany, you have uh, hundreds of lawyers who uh, uh, rush and, and, and write comments and commentary on, uh, on new pieces of legislation. So that's, that, again, might be the difference of, of size, why you don't like your legislator that much as, as you do, as we do. There was a conference where when a, um, a Minister of Justice uh, um, offered a new law, and there were 200 professors sitting in the room, and they all disliked the new law. They were all against it. There was a huge discussion and the ministry said we will make it anyway, so it was very aggressive discussion and then at last one professor entered and say. let's take it, we will change it. So we will change it by arguing we will we will uh, take the judges and we will make what we think it's good the legislator we, we does not make problems, we will make it. Matis, please. Um, thank you. Um, I would. I would uh like to strongly disagree with, with Hannes uh, because I think um, uh, Estonia clearly belongs to the continental um, law family or, or uh, room and um, this is um, I mean this imagination that uh, laws have been translated and, and just um, uh, taken over I think this is this is not true. Um, what has have been taken over are arguments and, and structures, and to really understand them, you have to perhaps sometimes um, know the language and know the law, and um, that's why I would actually actually recommend the university to make uh, German obligatory for law students because uh, it is very very difficult to to be a lawyer and to really understand what go, what's going on if you don't understand German. But anyway, um, I would um, come back to this um, uh, article uh, or section two um, uh, 
42 uh, PGB um, because um, you, you brought up this, this commentary, this, this uh, fragment of, of the parlance, and, and, and then um, uh, you um, interpreted a little bit this, uh, this um, um, uh, uh, section. But I wonder, perhaps this, um, and this is, this is something that has bothered me since my studies, law school studies, um, is, um, is this Q42 BGB a private law uh, norm at all? Or is this a public law norm? Because this is something that, um, that um, uh, can override uh, um, uh, a contract. And um, I think it, it, it might be, perhaps it is, it is something in the BGB, which is private law clearly, but this is perhaps a public law element. And that's why this is so strong. And that's why it should be inter interpreted differently. And if we understand this like um, as a public law norm, perhaps some, some, some things uh, uh, might be clearer. I don't know, what, what, what is your opinion? Thank you. Nowadays, you could say that because it's used to um, put um, constitutional law into private law. So you could say it's a it's a public norm. Uh, if you look in the history of this norm, where it comes from, it has nothing to do with public law. So it's from the bona fides. It's Roman law. It's it's merely private law in Rome. It's especially law for contracts. There were contracts uh, um, which always had inherent this bona fides concept, like emptio uh, venditio, um, uh, the, the, the sales of goods, goods. And um, it was not used in public law and it was not allowed to have any contact to public law until 1958 in Germany. So it was the high constitutional court who said that this bona fides concept has anything to do with public law. This was not before, it was only used in private law. And, <clears throat> but you could say, for example, in national socialism, they used this bona fides concept um, to politicize the private law system. They use it to uh, change the law of contracts by saying uh, all the norms with these bona fides concepts are, are uh, connected with principles of the national socialism. And these were, you could say, public law principles. So uh, um, this concept came up in the national socialist era, but uh, um, it was frankly, a concept that public law uh, uh, regulates private law with these norms in 1958. And before that, uh, no one would, would have said that, uh, especially because the judges did not have a concept with this norm. They do, did not say we have a social concept or we have to socialize uh, the, the unfair terms or something like this. They used the bona fides simply from case to case. So they had a case and say, this is the result we cannot accept this, the result. This is simply not fair. They corrected it as the Romans did. So it was a case to case method. There was no concept behind it, no public concept. But I think today you could say this, yes. So it's a good explanation for what bona fides at the moment uh, in Germany means. Uh, I can't see any any hand. There's one, Karin. I, I, oh, Karin. Karin is professor for private law. Welcome. Mm, yes. Uh, also, many many thanks uh, from my side. It was very thought provoking. Um, what my question is a little bit. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It, it, it's about political correctness or. Um, you mentioned several times national socialism in, in Germany, uh, and I, I'm absolutely not aware of legal history. I, I'm not a legal historian, but how does, uh, do your legal historians um, deal with that, that uh, era? Is it, for example, politically okay to ask, was there something worthwhile at that era to be taken over uh, into current discussion into current law, for example, can we learn also something positive, for example, concerning 
what do I know, Sachenrecht, procedural law, whatever, that we could, you know, also apply today? Was there something good in the national socialism, legal thinking? Sorry if that's a wrong question, but that's a just very something, good um, yeah. That's a very good question. Thank you very much. Um, and you're absolutely correct. Um, this is in a kind of question of political correctness in Germany. If you would say that, you would have a problem. But there were some discussions, I may tell you. There were, for example, <clears throat> as all these uh, um, systems, they always have things from uh, ex post, you could say, there was something in it which you, you we could say that was not so bad. For example, they had a quite strong consumer protection. The GDR also was very strong in consumer protection, much stronger than the, the, uh, the German uh, um, Republic. Uh, um, so um, there was a theory whether there was a, um, whether in several parts society was modernized by national socialism. This was a very political incorrect and very offended theory in Germany. And the professors who wanted that, they were by far right wing. They were not AFD, but they were very conservative. So, um, and I always think you can take little things out of this national socialist era and say, that was not so bad. But as a legal historian, I, I never like this picking of raisins. Uh, uh, I think it was a, a, a whole political system with a special society. So uh, every, the consumer protection had his bad sides and you should always say, what did consumer protection mean? They wanted to protect consumers out of certain political reasons, which cannot be our political reason. So it was a, a, a war society when they made this. So they wanted to uh, give the so-called home front they wanted to stabilize the home front. So they gave, gave the, the consumers some certain, certain advantages. We would never argue like this today. We don't have this, this problem. This is a national socialist problem. So if you say consumer protection is something which came from the national socialists, I would say no. Consumer protection and national socialism had a, a name which we cannot accept today. So you should always not pick it out of the, the whole concept in the context, seen in the context, I would say there's not there are not many things which we could uh, um, admire in national national socialist era, but there were such theories. That's true, and they are yep. absolutely they are politically correct. Yeah, thank you. It's exactly because of consumer protection that I wanted to ask you. You brought out that it was much stronger in DDR. I was always, as I'm a consumer protection lawyer myself, I was always wondering how come because. You know, for me, it seems that in order to have consumer protection, you should also have consumption. And at least as Soviet Union was concerned, maybe it was better in the DDR, we didn't have so much to consume. We, we you know, we were lucky if, if the Communist Party gave us a permission to buy a car. So, so how exactly are we even discussing unfair commercial practices in, in, in this context. But maybe, yeah, maybe there, there was something different in DDR. But the, the GDR is the same, I think. It's, uh, um, GDR is, uh, the socialist concept is, they do not give you property. The, the property is owned by the state, but they give you consume. You have to, con you're able to con consume consumer goods. This is a, the, the key idea of socialist thinking, but it did not work. But it did not work because of the concept. It did not work because they could not produce enough. But in the idea, it was very clear that the the, the state has to give the the uh, the people the, the chance to to consume goods, so they have to protect them. But it did never worked, it, especially this consumer protection. The GDR never worked. They said the the if you 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 buy a, um, a radio, and the uh, and it's it's broke. And they are forced to produce uh, to, to repair it in eight days. This is law in the books. It never worked like this. But this is consumer protection. The GDR I, I, very strict, but it did not work. Yes. 
Yeah, it's like the discussion of, you know, uh, right now it's um, the popular discussion about sustainability. And then there is the question whether we can learn something concerning consumer protection and so sustainability from the socialist times. And I mean, this is again, for me, something that I can't understand because of course we were sustainable because we were just poor. We, we didn't have much to waste, but is this something to do with a concept of sustainability as we know it today? I hardly think so, but yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Hannes had uh, one question more. Yeah, yeah. I, I had a provocative question to Karin. Was there anything good in Soviet law? Um, especially in, in Stalin era Soviet law, which we could uh, take an, as, ex, as an example and, and take us um, as a guiding uh, pre, uh, example today, perhaps. Yeah, we have been through this discussion. Was there something good in Soviet Union with, with friends some time ago? Um, of course, there were some good things like Vanatallin, this is a certain Estonian liquor, which I admire, which is really the first one that comes to my mind. We had some good films and good books. Concerning law or yeah, legal policy or so, um, maybe that's, okay, that's even not so much to do with the law, but still maybe the fact that uh, women were entitled to go to work. Of course, it had it downsides as well as we know it but compared for example to to germany where if i understand correctly uh, a woman still uh, needed a written permission from her husband to go to work at 1960 so compared to that uh, we had more uh, freedom but of course it came again at the cost of, of um, little children spending you know weeks away from their parents so so there, that is not black or white. And to, to be honest, it was not uh, not only the right to work, it was the, the duty to work and, uh, <laughs> and had this other side also. Madis have one question now. Uh, thank you. Um, as a uh, response to Hannes, um, uh, actually the Stalinist constitution has been considered as one of the first constitutions in the world that uh, uh, had um, social rights in it. But however, um, my, my general question is, um, uh, what is the value of, of those arguments um, that um, derive from, from um, totalitarian, totalitarian uh, regimes? Um, how valuable are they? Are they generally invaluable because of the origin? Or can we learn something from it? Or what is your opinion as a as, uh, historian to, to uh, this issue? We would also always say um, this is all about, this is a political question. Why do you say there was something in, in socialism? You could say, we simply use it today. We do not say it's from socialism. So why do we say it's from socialism? Because we want to say not everything was bad there. And this is a political uh, answer. So I would say um, there's no reason to say we learned something as an historian. You would never learn something from, from somebody else. You would use the same concept in another context and would say it works very good. And then you could say, Perhaps they had it also in socialism, but we would al always try to find out what was the reason, what was the special socialist thinking about this. We would take a very close look because we would always expect that that argument to be used to say socialism wasn't all that bad. And this is the, the contemporary political argument, very dangerous. I have also one question by myself. You talked about the famous book of, uh, from uh, Franz Wiecke. Uh, I should take or, or make one question, uh, confession. Uh, the reason why this book is not very popular today in Estonia can be that I never popularized uh, Wiecke's work. I, 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 I have worked by myself in my young years with Wiecker's book a lot. And I had the feeling I, I can understand 
what is written in the New Yorker's book, but um, no, I don't have the feeling, the, I, I can understand what, what is written in the New Yorker's book. It's, or, 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 uh, it's one thing and the other one is, I can very, very well under, understand what is written in the New Yorker's book and I don't want to popularize uh, so, such a book. And, and so my, my, I, I never recommended this book to my people. Um, uh, but uh, an, another very famous book, uh, not from Viaque, but from uh, Carl Lawrence, is uh, widely used in Estonia, Methodenlehre der Rechtswissenschaft, uh, or methodology of, of legal research or, or legal scholarship. Would you say also some, some words about this book and author? I don't know whether it is. So two sentences to, to Viaka. Um, today, this book um, is not understandable anymore because it's part of a movement which started in Germany, and I think not only in Germany, all over Europe in the 20s. The, the, it was the great time of intellectual history. And um, there was, for example, a book of Eric Wolf who said, uh, great German thinkers. And then there was always, you had these epochs, liberalism, all these, these epochs moving on. And for every epoch, there's one person, Eike von Repko, he's Mr. Middle Ages. So his kind of thinking is the thinking of the Middle Ages. And this thinking that we are in an era of the crisis of liberalism uh, leads you to a history of private law without any private law. It's, you could say, it's a, it's a history of politics. So he does not say anything about property, about possession, about law of contracts or something. He says something about the crisis of liberalism, very high flying. And this also in a very philosophical way, nobody understands this anymore. This, this kind of history is gone. And I think it's good that it's gone because it's very, uh, uh, it's a very dangerous kind of political writing. And it's very, uh, um, uh, um, very in danger to become a merely political book, nothing else. And this is, I think, kind of Franz Wierke. Karl Lahrens um, is often used without the first part. I don't know how it is in Estonia. In Germany, we skipped the first part. This is the historical part. And in this historical part, uh, um, Karl Lahrens tells us what he learned from the others. He starts with Savigny, and then he tells you a story. And this story is not only totally false, it's very, uh, um, political and it leads you to, to, to him. He's the successor of them all. And his kind of value, value theory, value methodology, methodology um, is the result of all the mistakes the others made. So, um, and if you skip this historical part, you do not see the political uh, um, aim this book has. It seems to you as a merely technical book about methodological problems. I think methodology is never unpolitical. It's always a very political question. It, it, uh, and in this book, it's very, it's hidden perfectly if you skip the first part. And this is what Klaus Willem Canaris, when he, uh, uh, he made the last uh, um, edition, um, he skipped the historical part. And there was a huge discussion in Germany because they said, if you skip the historical part, you do not understand what he wants. It seems that if it is simply a technical book, it is not at all. He has an idea. And if you want to understand Karl Lahrens, you should translate Richtiges Recht, 1975. This is his book where he tells you his, his philosophy. And his philosophy has, is phenomenology, uh, um, Reinach uh, Husserl. And he tells you something that um, we are in a, environment living in, and this environment tells us something about truth. It's an, it's a theory of uh, um, uh, um, I don't know the, the English word, the theory of uh, um, erkenntnis theory of, of, uh, of uh, erkenntnis theory, theory of epistemology. Yeah, episode, erkenntnis about legal, of our ability to separate between to be and ought to be, and how we are able to, to find the truth. And this, this philosophical theory is absurd. 
today. Nobody believes in this. If you read this book from 1975, you see behind all this hidden is a, in a way naive belief in the possibility of us to find values which are true, which are not a question of democracy and discussion and whatever. Uh, and he says, Vertrauen, for example, is something, Gleichheit is something which is simply evident to every human being. So read this book and translate this book and you will destroy the power of the um, Methodenlehre of Karl Lahrens, I think. Might be. <laughs> Whitehead, uh, the, for me, uh, the power of Lawrence was destroyed a long time ago because I, I studied in Kiel where Lawrence taught uh, long before me, <laughs> but uh, they still had um, the, uh, the books uh, he produced uh, in, in 1930s uh, in, in a special a section of the library. So I, I once uh, had a chance to, to order them and to, to uh, take a look into them. And uh, I mean, if, if there is. If, he if was a national socialist, world, simply. And he was an anti Semite. And, was, and I think one of the worst kind. He was at least one, yes. Uh, um, but I, didn't you find this interesting? Why was there a special section? In, in Cologne, there also was a, the books were hidden. And then all these books, before I came here to Cologne, they were given to my institute, not to the public library. So I have them all. And I said, this is not a good system. We should give it to every student. This can't be true that you have to be a, a scientist or somebody to, to read this forbidden book. It should be published everywhere. Yeah, but it's still, it's in Germany that some libraries, they always say it's very uh, um, rare, this book, we don't want to be destroyed or stolen. But in reality, in, in Cologne, still they wanted to keep this down. The, the explanation in Kiel was that these books are uh, actually so rare that they, uh, they cannot be kept in the public. <laughs> public yeah. section but it was possible it was possible to for everyone actually to to order it and to take a look into it but i had a chance to to uh, uh, uh because i worked there as as uh, by, by by a chair as well and so i i had the chance to to keep this book for a couple of days and, and then really to take in, a look into it so uh um the library is full of rare books. And if it's so rare, you could simply copy it and put a copy in the, uh, in the bookshelves. So, yeah, but it's always the same arguments, yes. Hannes, uh, I, I have a, a short uh, comment. Uh, it looks so that uh, the, 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 the liberal uh, German uh, uh, West Germany was not so, uh, or is not so different from the uh, from uh, socialist system with the special funds for books. <laughs> yes, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Well, another another thing you you told uh, Hans Peter was about the special and secret books for judges and and. Um, uh, access to judgments while the the public has no access to this uh, to the judgments i remember in estonia we had uh, a bit of a similar influence uh, i think in 90s and early 2000s uh, there were some secret textbooks uh, prepared for judges and uh, and uh, and lawyers didn't get access to those but that was luckily changed because i strongly believe that there can be, can be only one law for all all players in the in the legal field, uh, academics, uh, judges, and and lawyers and prosecutors. Um, but um, I, I have a question about the methodology uh, in Germany. Do you have any quantitative uh, methods used in legal history? Um, and 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 the question is yeah, in, in, in inspired by the this um, access to judgments because um, well, for instance, in the U.S., the judgments are analyzed by uh, on uh, quantitative methods or by using the quantitative quantitative uh, quantitative methods 
just to to see how um, um, uh, any well, individual judge is thinking or, or what are the trends and, and so on and so forth. In Germany, when you have no access to the judgments, you obviously you can't do that. But but are there maybe some other fields of legal history where the methods are used? Quantitative methods are used in uh, legal history, but I think not as strong at, uh, as the US. Uh, um, uh, I, for example, uh, uh, worked on the, when I worked on um, Treu und Glauben about uh, um, a good faith, I, I analyzed 2000 decisions uh, um, under certain argumentations. So um, it, it is done, but it's not so uh, uh, often done. At the moment, there are uh, quite strong movements with, going on with bibliometrics. So we want to try to, we try to find out which books where in which libraries and where were used by whom, for example, in the in the 15th, 16th, 16th, 17th century to, to see how the use communists spread over Europe. And we find that all the ideas we have that, for example, this author is very important or this author is very important are false because other authors, which we did not see yet, were, uh, were much more broader uh, in, the, in the libraries. And some very important uh, authors only were in few libraries, so not many were able to read them. So uh, we learn something about with bibliometrics uh, at the moment quite strongly. And uh, judgments, yes, sometimes, but not so often. One similarity, once more. I, I heard in my lecture from the first year that uh, the book of Hugo Croatius, the Eurabellia Quatsis, was uh, given out from the uni University Library of Tartu in the 17th century, 18 uh, times. And the, <laughs> the, this is the same, <laughs> same, yes. same method. To <laughs> so, America. I'm, I'm really curious now that uh, if you have been telling the same um, to your students in Germany, what uh, have been the reactions and the results? Have the students start uh, making better historical uh, overviews of their dissertations or have they now become completely scared and completely left uh, or skipping all the, the historical part? So <laughs> what can you comment about that? Usually I do not read all these uh, PhDs. Uh, we have about um, every year, my faculty has between 70 and 100 PhDs finished. So I do not know what they all did, but um, the discussions after my lecture always have these two parts. There was, especially for example, in, in, uh, um, in in Völkerrecht, in public no people's law, the what is it? International law. International law. In international law, it is very common to tell these huge stories, Crotius, Devatel, uh, uh, what what they all were about. To tell these stories about four hundred years, then this idea developed here and there, and then I give this introduction, and then they are frightened. <laughs> it does not seem to be so easy. Uh, um, um, so this is the one reaction. Then I say, okay, tell me why Grotius is so important, or what is so, why do you have to use what Devatel? Because everyone uses Devatel, or is he the important author? So you have to you have to ask more precise which was the one who's. You have to to give me reasons for what you do. So then they say, okay, this I would have never. Uh, I've, perhaps it would be better never have to have in contact with uh, Mr. Haferkamp. Uh, he's too complicated. So this is a problem. Um, on the other hand, um, what many of them really find interesting is this thinking about judges. And especially if they find out that constitutional law at the moment switches in a way. So many of very important German constitutional lawyers, Oliver Lepsius, Matthias Jestedt, uh, uh, Christoph Schönberger, uh, quite prominent names, uh, um, uh, uh, they work historically and they think about the judges and they make one project after another to understand what the Bundesverfassungsgericht did by knowing something more about the judges. So their interpretation of the constitution is based on knowledge about the judges. So they find out that, that there is at least one field in German law 
where law changes with an historical thinking method. And this starts to begin at least in private law also. The, Reichs, the, the Bundesgerichtshof is, there, there are some project, projects which historize the Bundesgerichtshof and which helps us more to understand these decisions and then to criticize these decisions because we know much more about the ideas which were behind these decisions. So this is one part I think which uh, they find interesting. And this, the, this part, Hannes also said, this part of these hidden books is, uh, they always say it's a scandal. Why didn't we know these books? Uh, um, yes, so some, some things are intensively discussed after. So I have the feeling that we are uh, in, in some way. It was very, 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 very interesting discussion also. And I'm, I'm very happy you, you, you take the time and, and, and that you prepared this in, in another language and that you, um, you was ready to, to discuss in, in this, this audience also the, this, uh, this presentation. And I'm very thankful also to, to the audience I, I think the, the questions were also uh, very interesting and, and, uh, and I hope we, we learned a lot of all of, uh, of these uh, people in this audience. And it was my great pleasure that you, <coughs> me, my, my honor, especially that some of you uh, decided to come to me, were, which were not part of the PhD program, which were not forced to listen to me. Thank you very much. It was a great honor that you listen to me. And I thank you very much for the discussion, especially I found this discussion very fruitful and very interesting. So it's, it's a pity that we are not even yet able to drink a beer together in this. I know mm -hmm. this place in Tartu, this uh, hall where they have this beautiful <coughs> beer. I know exactly where I would like to sit now. So it's really, <laughs> this, is a, this is a bad thing about this. I agree completely, and, and uh, I cannot promise we, we all will, will go to this place and, and honor you with a, with a glass of or, or bottle of, of beer. We can do it, <laughs> and, 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 and several people, or only few, uh, are, are in Tartu. <laughs> At the moment, yes. At the moment, that, but I promise we will do it in the future. <laughs> and when I'm there, I will all invite you to a good beer. Be my guest then. I would be honored. We, we have a very good memory. <laughs> they don't, don't have a, a good argumentations or good arguments, but we have very good memory. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And goodbye. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you very you. much.